We are preparing our aircraft to launch our Beggar One. We decided to name it as stupid as Russians usually call their equipment. Resident or Oilman 2. We have decided on Beggar One because it is assembled from the cheapest and possible spare parts. Do they fly far? Yes, quite far. 40 kilometers or more. We launched it, it returns. What do you want to examine now? There is one forest plantation where Russian tanks seem to be stationed. We will fly now and check. The front line is one and a half kilometers away. Ukrainian reconnaissance crews are doing everything possible to detect Russian equipment and adjust Ukrainian artillery fire on it. The shelling almost never stops here. Not far from our film crew, a mine fired by Russian troops has struck. Ukrainian reconnaissance crews do not stop working even when the enemy is firing with heavy mortars. A couple of minutes to match the coordinates, and Bega is already in the sky. Ready? Let's go! It enables the program and flies according to it. We don't even control it. We can act, and the drone does everything by itself. While Bega is checking the presence of Russian tanks by coordinates, Yevhen shows us one of the villages that the armed forces of Ukraine liberated from Russian invaders a month ago. Not a single house survived. All the locals have left. Goats and chickens roam the streets and ruins in search of food. We had to kick them out of the village. Look what's here. No one even wants to take it into his hands. Here are the white bandages. An enemy uniform lies near the destroyed houses of Ukrainian civilians where the Russian soldiers were stationed. Their equipment was stationed here, a number of knocked out armored personnel carriers. It seems like they had an inscription, 12 or 36th region, something like that. I looked it up, it seems to be the Astrakhan region or Ossetia. But in addition to the Russian army troops, there were also illegally mobilized residents of temporarily occupied territories of the Donetsk and Luhansk regions in this village. The helmets left here are probably from Soviet stocks. Here is my helmet, Kevlar, class 4, and here we have mobilized from the so-called Donetsk People's Republic. Here you go, a visual comparison of two fights. I wouldn't want to fight in that, never. With what can it be pierced? I think even from a slingshot, but its owner, apparently, has finished fighting. While we were talking to Zhenya, the mortar attacks became more frequent. Zhenya's colleague Vitaly noticed a drone that flew almost over our heads. Whose drone is this? Our? I don't know, but it's better to hide. In general, are there many enemy drones flying? There are enough of them. There are still a lot of Orlans. Our military is successfully fighting them. We don't even spare the S-300 missile system, because the Orlan is a very harmful thing. If you shoot an Orlan down, you can rest all day. We are headed to a wooded area, and at this time a duel between Russian and Ukrainian artillery begins. A tank is firing from that side, and our men most likely launched a drone and are trying to figure out the location of this tank and hit it from some kind of artillery hoser. Rifles and machine guns join the artillery battle and the whistle of mines. One and a half kilometers from us, another battle is taking place between the infantry of the armed forces of Ukraine and the Russian troops. The fighting is going roughly in the direction where they tried to attack earlier. And that's great. If they try to advance, they will suffer heavy losses. Let them come. We are waiting for them. The fighting did not stop, but the reconnaissance crews had to find their drone. This takes just a few minutes. This is a Russian drone. Its target is the military equipment of the armed forces of Ukraine. In order to hide from it, we ran into the dugout of Ukrainian infantry. 
важко, конечно, но уже до этого, до этого все звукаешь. It's hard, of course, but you get used to everything. You know how to behave, what to do. We have our instructions, we follow them. Tank is the heaviest. It has a supersonic projectile. It shoots there and it hits there. We meet 65-year-old Ihor in the dugout. He is an infantryman of the armed forces of Ukraine. Anya. Anya, four years old. Who is Anya? My granddaughter from my youngest daughter. And this is Ilya, grandson, five years old. Also mine. I have five of them. Therefore, grandpa. <laughs> Ihor's call sign is grandpa. He is the oldest here, but despite his age, he went to war in the early days of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. You know, when the grandkids started crying in the evenings and stopped sleeping, how could grandpa sit and watch? I went to protect my grandchildren, all of our children. Every child is like ours, and the grandchildren the same, and the troubles are common. And the joys are common. Would you like to say hello to your grandkids? Christia, Vika, Anichka, Ilya, Bohdan, hello to all of you. I'll be back soon. We will definitely ride bikes and go to the pool as planned. I love you so much. Meanwhile, the shelling subsides. We need to leave the position and take cover in a safer place. I don't. We get into a car and leave the front line. The infantry remains in the trenches. Any minute now Russian troops could open fire again. Arriving at a safer place, Zhenya takes out the footage from his beggar. We have everything here. Now we will download all this, watch and process it. And then give new targets for artillery. I hope so. So that there are a bit less Russians. We are all working on it. To find out if Bega has found its targets, Russian tanks, they have to view the captured footage and compare it with the coordinates. The data will be transferred to the artilleryman, who will then work on enemy positions. Reported by Marina Stepanenko, Anastasia Zhuk, Oleksiy Adrisov, UATV News.